are just so pleased to host four groups of questers today. Um, the Art League is so pleased that you came, and I'm so happy with the crowd that we have. Um, before we start, I would like to introduce the presidents of the Quester groups. Um, we have Pat Wagner, Marsha Wirth, Marilyn Jensen, and Ann Bevins. And that's the four Quester groups that are represented here today. And Elaine Wood, are you here? And Sue, would you stand up, please? These, there are co-presidents of the Janesville Art League. And that's a tough job. <laughs> I'm going to introduce Sherry Thompson. She's the president of the Women's Club, and she, too, wanted to welcome you and tell you a little about, about our home. Hi, ladies. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, like she said, I'm Sherry Thompson, the president of uh, Janesville Women's Club, and I get the honor of wearing this tiara. <laughs> and uh, this was donated by Meredith Helgerson, uh, one of our past presidents. I do not wear this to the meetings or around town, but it, it does sit on my dresser in our bedroom. Uh, and my husband and I have four children and two of which are girls, so they think it's quite lovely that I have a tiara. So it makes the job that much more fun. Um, so thank you for having me. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about the building and what we do here at the Janesville Women's Club. Uh, we do have four other clubs here at the building. We have the McDowell Music Club, the Art League, uh, AAUW, which is the American Association of University of Women, and DAR, which is Daughters of American Revolution. Um, and within the Janesville Women's Club, we also have a bridge club and a book club that meet monthly here at the building. And within all those five clubs, we have 450 members. So, and within the Janesville Women's Club, we have 140 active members. And I'm just gonna talk to you a little bit about what we do here monthly. We have monthly meetings, and our calendar runs from September to June. And some of the topics that we have, we have local companies come in and uh, display their things. Like we have Brad from Floral Expressions come in and he gets to sh work his magic with the Christmas tree and bows. And we all you know, sit around and learn how to decorate for the holidays and that's fun. And we've had uh, cooking demonstrations by the speakeasy chef, he's come in. And uh, we also, in the spring, we all get together and put together Easter baskets. Everybody brings in donations, baskets, grass, eggs, toys, candy, and then we, then the community service uh, chair gets to go around and deliver those the next day. And in the past two years, we've made over 100 each, each year. So that's a lot of fun and very rewarding to do. And that was my first position here at the Women's Club was the community, community donations chair. So that, that was a lot of fun. Um, and this month, we're having Ryan Masterson come in and uh, speak about the history of women in Janesville. So that's this month's uh, topic, and that, that'll be very interesting for us, so that'll be a lot of fun. Um, and each month, we also collect donations for uh, the community. We collect items for ECHO, uh, for the Janesville Schools Breakfast Club, um, snacks for the, for the classroom, school supplies, and also for Rock County Humane Society, and also a bunch of different other you know, locations in Janesville and around the community. Um, so we always find lots of fun ways to, to support our community. Um, we also have our spring style show uh, that raises money for the foundation for the preservation of 108 South Jackson. That's this beautiful building that you're in this afternoon. And we have the style show at the Janesville Country Club and it's a style show and a silent auction and a lunch. It's, it's a beautiful, always a beautiful afternoon and it's always lots of fun. Um, and then we've also added a foundation fundraiser that we do here at the building. It's a very fun family event. We have a bounce house for the kids and it's a run walk and all that money also goes to the foundation. And um, the money that's raised on those two uh, events are used to restore the building. 
And some things that we've done in the past is the, uh, the tuck pointing, which is the mortar between the bricks uh, of the building. So we had that done. And the window sills, all the window sills downstairs were repainted. And we've had the parking lot resurfaced and the roof worked on. Um, so those are just some examples of things that we do to help restore our beautiful building here. Um, and we also rent this building, too, to our members. Uh, you know, you can rent it for a shower or a small wedding reception. So, um, but thank you so much for having me today, and enjoy the rest of your program. Thank you. Questers just wanted me to wait, make one announcement for them. They're going to be taking a bus trip into Antiques and Garden Fair Saturday, April 21st, and they have four tickets left. So if you, yeah, I, can't, I'm, I, I did a minus one. They had five, now they have four. <laughs> and you can talk to any of the Questers, um, and I'm sure they can, they can help you out there. I'm going to just run over a little bit how we would like this program to, to work. Nancy Bell Douglas will be our first speaker, and she's going to talk about our Wisconsin collection, which is a celebration of Wisconsin's 150th birthday. What's intriguing about that is that she knows some of these people personally, and I know you're going to enjoy what she has to say. Then we're going to have Barb Tapovich. She's going to just speak a little bit about what we plan to do to improve the building and the gallery um, that's coming up, we hope, this summer. And then Nancy Ziegler was nice enough to bring her two dolls in, which also relates to our art here in this gallery. Then we're going to do a small piece on before and after because we've almost finished the restoration conservation work on our oils. And um, I will be doing that. And Kay Jelenic will then finish up with the history of the Art League and how this building came to, to be. And she's found some very, very interesting things about the Art League and the history of Janesville. So I hope you have a really good time today. I hope you enjoyed your lunch, and welcome. We're so pleased to have you here. Nancy, you're on. <laughs> but I won't be the first to sign up for the run walk this fall. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Um, the Art League in J uh, Janesville, um, which has been going on with members since 1894, is certainly, I think, going very strong due to the very strong people who have been uh, working on the continuation and restoration of the works in the collection. What I'm talking about particularly is the celebration of a Wisconsin's 150th birthday year, um, which of course would have been 1890, what am I saying, 1998, <laughs> since statehood in 1848. And uh, an interesting story with it, there were only 125 of the original etchings made. And we do have one of the artists here who has worked on the project. Uh, it was a coming together of not only a huge explosion over the years in Wisconsin printmaking. Um, a commentator um, uh, by, by about 2000 was calling it um, a gentle mafia <laughs> because right after World War II and after the Depression and so on, uh, there was money enough to hire more people when <laughs> to teach when uh, the campus in Madison uh, still had Quonset huts. And Warrington Colescott was one of the first hired af by um, by uh, uh, Mr. Sessler, who we have one of his works, which is now under examination for repair. Um, and at that point, he was introduced about 1949 to the art 
professor, art teacher, in a little Quonset hut, a summer session, of course, no air conditioning, and Sessler was sound asleep on his stool overlooking the work he was doing. And it, was, it went on upward from there. So actually, um, <laughs> Cole Scott uh, from California uh, soon took over not only all of the original printmaking, but he took over particularly the etching and talio work and then uh, Dean Meeker, we have one of his paintings here right in the center, Joseph's coat, uh, was added to, um, from Chicago, to um, uh, take over particularly lithography and many, many other media. Um, uh, uh, certainly, um, well, people like Gleckler carried on with woodcut and so on. And this particular project really, in a way, was the brainchild of uh, uh, Justice uh, David Prosser. And I'm going to say right away, and we're not putting politics into this, because <laughs> two of the works are from our collection are now on display in the offices of Senator Tim, Tim Cullen. So <laughs> putting that aside, let us say for questers, for people interested in collecting anything, David said he was self-taught as a collector, that he had grown up in a family where, yeah, they had old prints on the walls, and yes, there were some books around, but he went and he didn't have any courses in art or art history, but he was curious, and he started looking around and being very interested, and he did say, Actually, art or knowledge is power, and self-knowledge is free. You can get it at the library. You can get it by talking to other collectors, to dealers, in, or, or people interested. And that's the way he had gotten started. He was helping a congressman in, as a very young man. In, he was in Washington, and he looked at one of the outside, one of the offices, and someone had thrown out a woodcut. He liked it, and he thought, well, it's going out in the trash. So he took it home and turned out to be by a famous Japanese artist whose work was now worth $1,000, so you never know. Um, <laughs> he bought his first print, actually, at Crocs and Brandano's, a bookstore. Things were a lot easier then, and certainly could be gotten for a little more like a song. Anyway, um, because he had collected his own, he had collected original etchings himself for years, he was also interested in the new things, like Andrew Balkan's print shop on uh, uh, Park Street in Madison. He walked in one day. He happened to be already on the sesquicentennial commission, and he thought, hey, light, this is a wonderful, wonderful studio, and let's get together and have artists, 15 nationally known artists uh, who have ties to Wisconsin, and among them is Bruce <laughs> Nauman, who gets hundreds of thousands, right, for his work right now as a conceptual artist and has shown at the Louvre. And there are artists from Chicago, um, and we're going to introduce one of them now who has moved to Wisconsin, who has brought her own copy of the original etching that is part of one of the three Rock County people who are in the collection of 15. Susan. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure what anyone would like to know, but I worked at that shop with Andy for quite a while. It was a real, uh, ex very fascinating experience. I do very detailed work. And if any one of you knows how etchings are done, you soak the paper and run it through a press with a plate. Well, if you stop and think about it, every time you run it through a press, 
it stretches a little bit. So to try and uh, register different colors all together in this kind of work, uh, I told him it wasn't possible. And we'd known him for years. My husband was a master printer, and he and Andy were friends. And, and uh, it was just a, he said, I can do it, I can do it. And I said, all right, I'll, I'll work with you. And of course, in the end, I wasn't as satisfied as he was because I'm a real, real <laughs> nitpicker. And I did some hand coloring on it, which I think actually is good. Um, but uh, it was so wonderful to be in that place over and over. We lived close enough that we could come and uh, be around the other artists who were working from far away. And, and it was just a wonderful experience. So <laughs> anyway, th this is called An American Autumn. It's a, a um, an imaginary piece. Everything I do is imaginary. So uh, I've been in Wisconsin for 23 years, and that's my mother who just moved up from Chicago. <laughs> She's an artist too. So. Okay. <laughs> well, I just wonder if the audience realizes you're talking about the collection in the Eleanor Mills um, area out in the front as you came up the stairs. And please do look at it on, on the uh, uh, way out, or actually we'll uh, also be able to see pictures of them. I'll just say very briefly that the three artists from Rock County, then we have Susan, we, we um, have John Wildey, who was the most senior member, who has, <laughs> was doing 75 in 150 years, portraits of the friends and former no longer living artists that he knew. Um, and of course, Munio Makuchi, um, who had taught at UBROC. Um, and I had actually, well, anyway, that uh, a lot of us had studied with him, I think. And um, besides that, then there were many works that seemed to reference Northern Wisconsin, where we would uh, go for vacation sometimes. Lords of Lake Horseshoe, the grandson of Nancy Eckholm Burkert. He's wearing a deer mask and quite, quite uh, unusual. But then Munio Makuchis was the wonderful, wonderful maiden of the North Woods, woman of the North Woods. She is pregnant. And uh, caressing her is a lake sturgeon with the moon and uh, northern lights in back. A very, very imaginative work. Um, and also Tom Utek, Wind Andaki, which was, um, again, an imaginary Indian name, but of, of wolves, in the, et cetera, in the wild. Uh, William Wiley, active in California, did a an unusual map of Wisconsin with a skater in the middle. Uh, then, Fran oh, Francis Myers, a husband of Warrington. Uh, uh, Cole Scott actually did the Monona Terrace, which uh, had been given to her. And besides that, we had... <laughs> All right. The Chicago, again from the Chicago School, Ed Paschke, uh, Libertad is actually based on the Venus de Milo. He was exhibiting in the Louvre at the time, and it was a commission for that. Uh, then, um, of course, Wisconsin, indeed, Warrington Cole Scott is of uh, the um, Sunday service, of which is a Packer game. He actually had never been to a Packer game, being um, <laughs> a Badger fan, but uh, <laughs> uh, he changed the uh, Detroit Lions that he was observing into the Chicago Bears. We had to have our closest competitors. <laughs> um, Martin Levine did very, very uh, detailed architectural, almost like a steel engraving, but it was an etching of a view from Usinger Sausage. You see the Wisconsin theme goes on and on. But um, say Tom Utek, who is, had done the Mexican masks, uh, wrestlers, and very, very frightened looking people under them. 
as quite a commentary. And by the way, he evidently is Madonna's favorite artist. Well, this is just an introduction to some of them, so do come and enjoy them. Thank you very much. This is the newspaper clipping of the collection that Nancy was talking about. The, all the, the prints are out in that gallery, and so I hope you take some, some time whoa, whoa. <laughs> to look at them. Um, oh, by the way, excuse me, the other two, two oh, go ahead. Oh, the other two uh, works were one that my husband Dick had done in the Rock River, where we he loved to paint, and uh, one of Murder, Wisconsin, by me. Actually, I've been taking Munio's course at the time. Munio, but we did our own thing. Munio was so zen. But it was <laughs> <laughs> And this is the print that Nancy was talking about that is in Senator Collins' office. And unless you know what they're representing and what they're trying to tell you, um, it's, it's difficult just to look at them. But we'll pass that around and this around. Um, I'm pleased to say that one of, my, one of the members of our restoration committee has taken that collection and she's going to put a little program together. So each piece will have their picture and a little bit of an explanation as to what, what it is representing. So we're looking forward to that. At this time, we're going to have Barbara Tapovitz come up and tell us about what's going to be happening in our gallery. Would you, would you like your piece? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have to walk around uh -huh. you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Barb Tapovitz, and I'm on the Art League's Restoration Committee. Um, with all these restorations, which Jan is going to talk about later, all these oil paintings being cleaned and restored and repaired, um, occurred to me, and I'm sure it occurred to many people, this would be a good time to just give this room a clean sweep and bring it up to speed. Um, I was in France last May and spent a lot of time in the Louvre, and they have such beautiful colors, but they have a multitude of rooms to work with, too. You know, they have smoky purple and reds, and they have wonderful colors. Well, we're limited to one, so that's kind of tough with a lot of ladies to decide. Um, <laughs> but I brought back some just pictures and ideas, um, you know, some paint samples and things, and um, we all had our favorites, but we worked with some experts and um, the curators for this gallery and um, came up with this color, which I hope everybody's going to like. We thought it would go well with the various paintings. It'll be just like on the paneled walls here. The rest will still be, it'll be a Luna white, it's called. Um, pick up the color from the chairs and the floors. Um, this was, this room was, this gallery was redone in 1960, and at the time, there were newly paneled Philippine mahogany wa paneled walls. Well, obviously, that's been painted over. In the 80s, they decided white was not verboten for museums, and so it became this. And, um, well, this was done, this particular one was done 20 years ago, so it's, it's been a while. We hope to get this done this summer while the women's club is closed and won't be disruptive, but it's going to entail taking everything down, the whole collection down, hopefully to one side, get that done, and then the other over. Um, what we hope to do this time is you might have an oil by somebody and sketches of his in the back or something. We're going to try to put all the artists, one artist's work together so you can see the various facets of the artist. Um, so as my mom always said, it's a good time to just freshen up. <laughs> freshen up leads to a lot of different things. Um, Victor at Home and Lindsay Paint has agreed to donate all the paint for this project, two, two, um, two coats to make sure it's a pure color. And Doug Markline fondly remembers this place from when he did piano recitals here, and it was a favorite place of his mom's. So he's offering to have someone do the painting at about half the cost we would have been paying otherwise. So it's going to be a reasonable. Um, so this is the color, and I hope you do like it. Um, the nail holes are all going to be filled, so you know this, this will probably be hung very much like it is, but we're going to be looking to other people for teeth as well. Um, there'll be some adjustments here, but like I said, trying to keep the hunts together, the silvas and stuff. So 
we hope by next fall we'll be able to have a gathering and everybody will be able to see it finished. Okay. Thank you. And Barb's worked very hard on this. She also worked very, very hard on the gallery down at, at JPAC that was um, dedicated to um, Marilyn Keating. So thank you, Barb. You've done a lot for us. This leads us into the dolls because they were here once upon a time <laughs> when we were also decorating. So Nancy Ziegler, you want to come up and tell us about your dolls? Well, like so many of you, I'm a collector, a conserver, and I'm really interested in conserving the history of dolls. Um, the two that I brought today are formerly owned by a Janesville artist. Her name was Gretchen Frick McBlair. Her father had printing company in Janesville that used to be on the Milwaukee Street Hill. And in years later, Bobby Coyne had that business. And they printed calling cards and all kinds of invitations, funeral cards, anything that anybody needed. Well, Gretchen was born on January 27th in 1901 in Janesville, Wisconsin, the daughter of Marie Sanger Frick and Herman W. Frick. Her parents were high-class German people. Mr. Frick owned Frick Printing Company and printed Janesville's only German language newspaper. And he also did the usual wedding invitations, business cards, and calling cards. Mrs. Frick was an excellent seamstress, and it was she who made most of the clothes for both of these little dolls. The tiny calling cards for Mrs. Hopkins were printed by Mr. Frick, and since he had some artistic ability, he may also have made the tiny brass comb and two brass hairpins that are in her rolled hair. Mr. Frick's hobby was casting large pieces in cement, artistic pieces such as three mask faces that you see in old theaters. Gretchen showed artistic ability during her school years. She went on to study art at the Art Institute of Chicago. She first worked as a fashion illustrator around 1925 and beyond. And this was before they used photography in the Sunday newspaper to show you what Marshall Fields was going to be featuring for the spring collection. Gretchen did the line drawings for those kinds of ads. She also worked for major New York stores. She worked at McCall's Magazine and the Woman's Home Companion Magazine as an illustrator. She also illustrated children's storybooks. Gretchen used her pen name, Nina Granada, for the early 1930s. As a teacher, Gretchen taught art at two New York boys schools, the Polytechnical Institute and the Traphagen School. Gretchen's husband, Robert McBlair, was a poet, writer, and a songwriter. Out of these creative beginnings evolved a lady who delighted in all who knew her. She always dressed to the nines and a bit heavily made up, but she was, had so much class that it really didn't matter. As a child, Gretchen must have enjoyed very creative and realistic play because her little doll, Mrs. Hopkins, who was her first doll, she's the small one, had a real personality and a very authentic existence. 
Mrs. Hopkins is the subject of several watercolor paintings that Gretchen did of her. At times when she wanted to, as Gretchen told me, play with color and texture. So you'll see in the paintings here, the backgrounds are a little bit garish, but she was not concerned so much with how it went with her doll. She was trying different rhythmic patterns or different textures just for fun at home. Gretchen continued to live at 229 Jackman Street, the home that she grew up in until her death in March of 1982. But she, w she went to New York to have these other teaching positions and work positions, and then came back to Janesville with her husband as an adult and was fortunate enough to, her house was still there and she moved back into her own home. And next door to her was the Reverend Dr. Humphrey Waltz. And he was her next door neighbor and he was named executor of Gretchen's estate. Humphrey's wife had also grown up in her house next door to Gretchen. The two girls had played together. And then as adults, they came back and lived next door to each other. So one day, back in the late 70s, I got a call from Ginny Swan and Gretchen McBlair. Their dolls needed restringing. So they brought Carol and Ginny had a China head doll, I think, that needed some work done. So they brought them over and I fixed them up for them. And they were so excited, they said they were going home to have a tea party for the dolls <laughs> to celebrate their newfound health. Well, along with Carol there, the one that I had restrung, the taller doll, I did a history of her manufacture. She was made, both of these dolls actually were made by the J.D. Kessner Company in Waltershausen in Thuringia in Germany. And so I did a history for her and I always left blank pages. And I said to Gretchen, go home and write down some of your memories and playing with Carol and keep it with her. Well, she never did. I don't know on either of these dolls how they got their names, except that Mrs. Hopkins was lucky enough to have calling cards printed at the Frick Printing Company. <laughs> and so she has about 31 calling cards in a little box in her entourage, <laughs> and that's how I know her name. So anyway, that little book, that little history that I wrote about Carol was the prompter for the Reverend Dr. Humphrey Walls to give me a call so that I might go and help them determine what they could expect at auction. There was an auctioneer in the house. I went with my books, my pen, my pencil, my paper and everything. And I made him an inventory list of all the clothing, all the current value on both of the dolls, and I handed it to him. And he asked me, he said, are you interested in either of the dolls? And I said, yes, I'm interested. I plan to come to the sale tomorrow. Well, he said, I don't think you have to wait through the whole sale. He said, I will treat them as my bequest, and you may buy them today, but you have to go home and talk to your husband. <laughs> he had no clue that a woman could have her own money. <laughs> so I got in the car, drove around the block a couple of times, came back and said he loves the idea. And the girls went home with me. Well, then, when Gretchen died in 1982, her good friend and neighbor, Jenny Swan, was still alive. So I called Jen, 
and I had her tell me everything she could about Gretchen and her childhood. I'm a big bookie that way. I have books on everything. I write them myself. But, um, and that's where I got the information about these dolls, but I don't know where they got their names. But I know that the day that they were preparing for the auction, there were representatives from the Art League that were picking up her paintings. And there were representatives from the Historical Society that was picking up the silver. And there was a very out of sorts auctioneer in the house that I have never seen a grown man have a tantrum, but I saw one that day. Because <laughs> he was missing commission and he was not a happy camper. So anyway, I have kept careful history on Gretchen as much as I can and on the dolls. Each one of them has her own complete book of photos, whatever I've done with them. There's some pages there that show the illustrations of their clothing wardrobes. Most of the clothing was made by Gretchen's mother, but a lot of it was made by Gretchen herself as a youngster, probably around 1907 or so. So you're welcome to come up and interview the girls. They love the company. <laughs> Thanks. That was wonderful and very entertaining. I'm glad Karen has to follow her. <laughs> Karen uh, Gilbank is a member of our Art League and a wonderful artist in her own right. And because we have a painting that's very special and, and going to be hung for the first time, she's going to go over the Silvis paintings that we have here in house, which is three. So Karen, come on up. Karen's pretty special, actually. She served in her country in the Navy, then came back, and she went to college, and she'll be an uh, art graduate this spring, right? Wow. Yeah. Karen, go ahead. I'm Thank going you. to change some of these, so Karen can use this for a, a demonstration. Well, I'm going to talk about just a few minutes about William Silva, and he was an American Impressionist painter. And um, he was born in 1859 in Savannah, Georgia. And he died in 1948 in Carmel. Um, now, the Art League um, is lucky to have three of his paintings. And um, we have Into the Mist, which is on the back wall, which has recently be re been restored, along with the other two, Windswept um, Cypress and um, Carmel by the Sea or at Monterey. And the way the Art League obtained the three pictures were, or paintings were that um, two of them were donated by Ida Harris. And the Into the Mist was purchased by the Janesville Art League when he gave a um, talk here and showed some of his work in 1916. Um, so I will pass around um, some of the paintings before they were re restored. They were recently restored by Barry Bauman. He um, donated his time and did an excellent job and they've been in storage all this time, so they haven't been available to view. Um, and so I'll start those. I don't think I trust this. <laughs> I'm going to put it back on the table. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm also passing around some little um, photos from the internet that I took because I'm originally from California and um, my favorite place to go with my sister who lives back there in Carmel, a half hour from there is Point Lobos. And as I was surfing the internet, I found, I actually had some photographs taken of, of paintings that he has made. And um, I actually did that painting against the wall of Point Lobos myself before I even knew that William Silva existed. So it was kind of special to find out that the Art League had three of his paintings. But, um, he started um, out um, in his um, father's China ware business. When his father died, he moved to um, Chattanooga, Tennessee. And so he was an amateur painter up until then. And then he didn't start painting till the age of 50. So you're never too um, old to start painting. And um, then he, uh, his wife um, encouraged him to retire from the China ware business. And so he went to the Julian School in Paris where he 
was taught under um, Paul Lawrence. And on his return back to the States, he lived in the East Coast several years before he moved in 1913 to Carmel, where he painted outdoors. He had his own um, <coughs> little studio built into the sand dunes. And he painted there for 35 years, and he became very well renowned there. And also, he was known as the finest artist in Chattanooga, Tennessee at the turn of the century. So um, um, I'd just like you to have a chance when when this is over to get up and walk around and look at his work. Can we look at your piece? Oh, if you want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Before we do some photos of what some of our paintings looked like before they went to Lake Forest, I just wanted to um, share with you some of the people that we've been working with. And that was Joy Beckman, the director of the Wright Museum at Beloit College, and Craig Hadley, who was her assistant. And they've supplied us with interns that have been able to get almost all the information on every oil painting and every watercolor that you see in this room into our computers. With that done, then we can start working on the catalog. And as you watch this today, you're going to see how important it is for people to have a catalog in their hands so they know what they're looking at and something about the artist. So I wanted to thank those people and then talk a little bit about Barry Bauman. Uh, Karen referred to him a few minutes ago, and he was with the Art Institute of Chicago for many years. When he retired, he started his own business called the Chicago Conservation Center. When he did that, he wanted to give something back, and he knew that nonprofits and small museums were struggling. So what he's proposed and what he's been doing for several years is that he donates his labor then you have to come up with the money to pay for the materials. We have been very, very fortunate here. What we did was start a program called Adopt a Painting. And we had so many members step forward and adopt a painting and pay for the materials. And um, we just got another very large donation that I really want to, to mention. Since we're finishing up with our oils, we have to start worrying about some of our other pieces. We have five pieces in the back that were done by Helen Hyde, who studied in Japan, exhibited with a Japanese artist, and won awards. They're very significant and very valuable. Dick Rost and Marilyn Fitzgerald called me about a week ago, and they will help us pay for the materials to have them put back in their original um, form. And what's happening is they're on acid-type backing, and so the paintings are starting to burn around the edges. 
Um, but I was so pleased. We had a, a program back in April, uh, no, October when Barry came, and at that point we, we thanked everybody that had given money up to that point and had adopted uh, so many paintings. And Mike and Sue Borden stepped uh, up after that, as did Huffcore, and again um, adopted some of the oils that we needed to have done. And Barry only works with oils. He does not work with anything else. So we've been very, very fortunate in that area. He was the first national conservation um, laboratory that stepped forward and started to donate their time and their labor so that small, small uh, galleries like ours and small museums could uh, keep their, their art in good order. And had he not done that, we could never, ever have afforded to do that. If you like, I have a folder here. I always ask him to put at the bottom, if he hadn't donated his labor, how much it would have cost us. And in my head, probably by the time we're done, it will come to right around $100,000. So we have just been so fortunate to work with him. He's been such a good friend to us. Now, is it, I'm going to have to move over here. I'm not going to get into a lot of the history or a lot of the times when these were purchased. That's not what this is about. This is about showing the work that was done. So we have some photos of what it looked like before we sent it to Barry. And I'm going to just take this down. And that's, oh, we've got to take it. That's okay. Just okay. Take it. One of, the, one of the more important pieces that we had done was this one, and that's what the Gazette featured. And this is called Lake Geneva. And if you just give me a couple minutes and then you would turn around and look at the back wall, you'll see the portrait of a man. Mm -hmm. That's called the philosopher. The one above it is called Lake Geneva. The two to the side are not oils. They are watercolors, and they were done by Mr. Timmons. Mr. Timmons actually lived on Jackson Street, as did his cousin and his aunt and uncle. <laughs> he came back many, many times to Janesville, and if you have the time, there on the card table in the back are um, pieces from the newspaper celebrating his return and talking about what a wonderful artist he was. He went on and painted some of the most important dignitaries in Chicago, but he came back to Janesville very, very often. The top picture was painted off the porch of a Janesville Art League member in Lake Geneva. And why I'm talking about him right now is because these two pieces here were done by Susan St. John. She actually met her husband here in Janesville. Mm -hmm. This is what it looks like before we took it into Mary. You can see how dark it was. And these, these flowers actually come out as he finished it. The one on top, this is called the Mexican Flower Girl. The one on top is called Avery Sabell. She used the same model for both of those. She too went on to paint in Chicago, and actually she painted the court, the Queen's Court in Spain. And I a picture, and I really, here it is. You can just see how bad it was. And it's <laughs> rather entertaining. You take these in to a shop, and you say, now I want you to pull them up. Well, they see how dirty it is, how dark it is. Of course, they're, they're, they're going to clean it up. <laughs> so you, you have to say, no, 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 no. We really want it to look that bad. It's OK. <laughs> so this is what we have here. The connection between the two, not only that both artists were here in Janesville, um, her son was going to give us the Mexican flower girl took it to Mr. Timmons to have it framed and kind of touched up a bit. He, of course, knew all about us, convinced him that he should also give us the second oil. So that's how we ended up with mm -hmm. being Mr. Bell. Mm -hmm. When the Gazette did that article, we were asked, and Barry was asked, and I was, well, what's the connection? Why is so, so but everybody's so enthused about this? And as you go through some of these paintings, you realize the connection. Um, this one back here, is a second reflection. It hasn't been done yet. 
but Pat Nolan adopted that, and she went to school with Wilma. They were classmates, and she, although he's passed away, she still uh, communicates with his wife. So there's always a story. <laughs> this is our flagship piece, our most important piece. It's an Edgar Payne, and I'm going to pass these around. If you look at this, and you see how gray it is, that's actually how it looked. If you have time afterwards and you're looking at this, all the reflections in this lake, we couldn't determine that. It was just a piece of dark spot at the bottom. All the greens came out, the snow turned out white, mm -hmm. this was all cloudy up here, and now it's the bright blue sky. Once Mary gets done with this, they're good for over 100 years. And the, the finish she puts on them will um, not yellow and not crack. And that's what was happening to so many of these pieces. They hung in the old library, so they had a lot of coal dust on them, a lot of dirt, and a lot of uh, dust. Back then, they didn't have a finish um, that did not yellow, or what I call crackling. And if you take a look at this one, which is going to go in next, and it was by a Mrs. Tanberg, who was our first president. She was also one of the founders of the Janesville Art League. You'll see what I'm talking about when I say crackling. You can also see how the canvas is bulging, and that's why it tears. Along with what Barry does as far as conservation, he also has what he calls a stretcher that he puts on. And lots of small galleries and small museums don't necessarily have a climate control. So when the, the paintings are expanding and contracting, that's what's going to cause the saving and the ripping of your canvas. What he puts on is a stretcher that looks like this. This will protect your canvas. It'll it, uh, expand and contract as needed. He's the only one that has it. <laughs> and it's well worth the time and the money to preserve <coughs> like this that are so valuable. <laughs> I want you to take a very good look at this because when it comes back, it will look like Mrs. Kevin's painting up there, which was done in California. And she was also one of our first members. And I believe that was adopted by the young lady. <coughs> The other significant piece, and you can kind of compare this when I'm finished.
Carpenter, who is my co-chair, mm -hmm. took pictures of the back of this, which also emphasizes why the stretches are so important. See how the canvas was torn? There was pieces of wood wedged in the sides trying to hold it apart. Um, we can pass this around if you like. Um, this is kind of what it looked like. And now it looks like the back of the smaller one that I just showed you. We'll be here if you'd like to look around, if you'd like to compare some of these paintings. Um, Kay will be here. She'll have her presentation shortly. But after she's done, if you have any questions, uh, Karen will be here. Kay will be here. And Nancy Bell will be here. So we'll be happy to help you. Thank you.